All right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly, horribly named podcast series. And the QA is the most important part of this whole conversation this week. It's the last Monday of the month. We're doing a pajama podcast, a nice chill, uh, just uh, no major structure. We're not doing the news block and the gadget block and all of the show links. I mean, we can pull show links up if we want to chat about specific stories or if we want to dig into some news, but I'm going to try and let the chat just kind of roll with it, see where we end up, see where we go. I'm already seeing some really fun folks in the chat because I mean, the title of this podcast is we need to talk about the Pixel 6a. I've had it for basically a weekend now. And uh, essentially, uh, everyone who had videos out on the first day of this getting sent to reviewers, uh, all of those people are wrong but me. <laughs> it's going to be one of those shows, folks. Um, it, it is sort of why we're co-streaming a little more aggressively. The show is not coming back to YouTube in any earnestness, but this one I felt was important enough to extend the invite and expand the conversation. And 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 again, we're seeing. I'm seeing Vince. I'm seeing Demar. I'm seeing Grounded Tech. Uh, Barry's been jumping around in the chat. Uh, there's just so many people here. I can't even romp a room. Simon says Hypno feels a disturbance in the snark. It's like millions of tech enthusiasts cried out and then were suddenly silenced. <laughs> Dave Burns. Um, hold on, let me pull this one up too. Uh, I need a long-term review. You've had it for a whole 96 hours. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, it has a Google label on it and it's like a fancy purse. And so because it has a Google label on it, basically it's not worth it. It's for the monies. You should only buy phones from labels that make YouTubers lots of money for their video views. Only confirm the bias of the 80% of North Americans who own a Samsung or an Apple. And that's the only purchasing recommendation that we can make in good conscience because you would not want to be seen uh, you know, in, in, in like last season's shoes. Am I right? <laughs> Pat goes in. We need to see Pixel 6a versus the Steam Deck. Oh, my Steam Deck's in the bedroom. I, I promised I was going to show off all of my Vampire Survivor. Uh, I've, I've, I've done the entire uh, uh, achievements list on Vampire Survivors. Um, I, I'm not going to subject you guys to another two hours of me playing Vampire Survivors. I mean, because really, that's only four runs <laughs> of Vampire Survivors. <laughs> Simon says, no, I was wrong about the pixel three days later. <laughs> oh, Vince, it's, yeah, okay, so hold on, hold on, we got to do this. This is critically important. Vince writes, Juan, have you given us your review of the hand feel of the Pixel 6a? So here we go. Um, well, you see, it appears to have been designed for some kind of evolved primate with an opposable thumb. So, I, I mean, it feels pretty nice in the hand. I'm really glad, like, Google did not go with shards of broken glass or rusted rebar in the design of this phone. So, I mean, like, it feels, like, it feels pretty nice. It feels pre pretty good. It feels nice. It feels good in the hand. Like, you could hold it and use it as some sort of ultra mobile pocket computing device. I mean, so, I mean, like, I feel like Google did what going to say pretty good. I. Uh, it's going to be all the tropes this week, folks. <laughs> all of the bad jokes that Juan likes to trot out. Gormlord, have you not heard of this? Hold on, let me, let me pull up Gormlord's comment. He says a Steam Deck. Now, Gormlord, I don't know if you've heard of this. This is, um, this is a revolutionary piece of technology. Um, so what you do is... Uh, so, I mean, like, if you have a deck. So, first of all, I can't review these very frequently because I just don't have the room. But when you have a deck, you get this machine and it steams your deck. And so that's a, that's a way you'll make, you can clean with the power of steam. It's like kind of like a, 
sort of like a high pressure intensity washing device. And so they call, I mean, they call it, it's, it's from a company called Valve, which is appropriate because they've got like spigots and nozzles. It's a valve and you steam your deck. It's the steam deck. It's pretty cool. I mean, you should definitely check it out. <laughs> I feel like I stuck the landing on that one. I don't know. Someone let me know. Was that corny enough or was that too corny? All right. So, um, welcome to this week's show. Uh, Co-streaming, I'm seeing lovely faces, and uh, I, I have to preface this with, um, if you're following on the Patreon, I published a script that I'm not going to shoot for sake of my own uh, mental health. <laughs> um, sort of a reaction to the reactions of those first videos that were put out by the Pixel 6a. I think you can kind of get a sense of how we were feeling. TK and I did a co-stream where we were both co-unboxing the uh, the Pixel 6a. <laughs> a lot to unbox. It's a cable and a, they still include the USB-C adapter. Um, yes, Dave Burns. Uh, it was an angry script indeed. I've started doing this thing where if I can't find a way to make a script fun and it just comes out as mean, like there's there's a snarky one and obviously I get really antagonistic. I, I don't like people who have bad hot takes on tech or who are just blind blinders on fanboys for Samsung and Apple. I like to pick at those people, but I like to try and have fun. I write scripts that eventually veer into just like they're just mean they're just angry and mean and so instead of you know trying to make those scripts work for my own mental health and for the sake of audiences on the internet i've started publishing them on the patreon and uh i mean obviously this wasn't like a real in-depth look at the pixel 6a from any kind of practical use this is like hours into really setting it up and using it and just like the first impression that this thing gives off, there's like a, there's an immediate awareness of what this thing could be for the average consumers out there. And I wrote I wrote this script, and I I had some very choice words for some of the other tech reviewers who I feel were unfair in taking shots at what this thing is. So a bit of that is probably going to end up in this stream. Uh, my feelings haven't changed, but I've been having so much fun with the phone. And there have been some really surprising elements um, in using the phone, too, that uh, I, I, I'm trying to focus more on the positive. I mean, really what we're looking at is an exceptional consumer. Um, in North America, we don't have anything like this. This is an exceptional consumer device that moves mid-rangers in the United States up to kind of back up to flagship killer kinds of products. The more I use the Pixel 6a, the more I'm thinking of it as less of a mainstream mid-ranger, mid-specs, better battery life for using a lower power SoC, but skimping on other sort of premium tier features. And the more I'm thinking of it as like, this is kind of a high performance hot rod in a lower cost shell. So we're making targeted compromises on some other features. Like I'm sure I've already seen, um, you know, people talking about 60 Hertz on the screen. It's good enough for an $800 iPhone 13. It's good enough on a $450 pixel. If you're complaining about that, like that's some kind of objective purchasing decision from average consumers, I very much doubt your ability to assess tech and and understand who tech is for. Like, I think you're bad at tech is what I'm saying. Um, I do have to throw a shout out. Uh, Grounded Tech Dan subscribed on, on Twitch with Prime. Uh, they've been subscribed for six months. Absolutely uh, a major thank you, a major heads up. Uh, I, I appreciate the support on the stream, on the channel. That is very kind of you. Um. <laughs> Oh, and SA Bandito, uh, definitely trading in my Pixel 4a for the Pixel 6a. I got it for about 140 I don't know what $140. Um, but I saw a bunch of people were doing some really smart trade-ins. Like, hey, I found an old, used, hard Pixel 3, and I got it for like 120 bucks, And then I'd use that as a trade-in to get like 
you know, an additional hundred dollars off after accounting for the price of the Pixel Three. So there's some really sh smart shopping going on, especially that this phone, when you actually buy it, when you spend your money on it, um, comes with some decent uh, some Pixel Pixel Buds Pixel Buds A series, which are some handy little headphones. Um, Gormlord, man, the people I subscribe to all like it. I'll, I'll have to see what the others are saying. You don't. Because this is part of why I got real angry, is I feel like this is an overly manipulated game. My article, uh, the, the article that I posted, the script that I was going to shoot, was heavy, heavy on the psychology of the YouTube algorithm, totally manufacturing a kind of commentary which is not fair. There's nothing objective about these reviews. I feel they are are increasingly informed by YouTube metrics that get the creator paid. And they might be that person's honestly held opinions. And their honestly held opinions are the opinions that best pay them and their staff. If this, if this phone were doing better in YouTube search, then I guess it would be a better phone and more people would like it and I would give it a better review. The tail is wagging the dog. So, um, <laughs> Dave Burns, um, hold on, I gotta pull this one up. Juan, how can you be having fun with the phone? Didn't you read the room? The nothing phone one is better because I am easily swayed by flashy keynotes. Uh, yeah, yeah. But again, I feel like there's something about the nothing phone which strikes a chord in terms of search and interest, watching videos, watching reviews. And again, haven't we seen some of, like, the direction of that commentary being kinder to a first-generation mid-ranger product priced mid-pack? I mean, that is not a cheap phone. And we don't know. Is, is the Nothing phone going to be supported well? What kind of issues will the phone have? I've seen people complaining about, like, the lights starting to peel on the inside of the phone. Things that would have been immediately pounced on as absolute deal breakers for, I mean, Google is a huge company. Can't they make the better phone? But we're extending this kind of consideration to the nothing. At the same time, tech reviewers keep saying things. Well, don't buy a phone for what it might be able to do. Buy a phone only for what it can do today. And I've done most of my review on the Pixel before it's even had updates to catch it up to the proper security patch. You know, like, I feel we've been doing this dance with the A-series Pixels since the beginning. Pixel 3a comes out, all of these confuzzled... Um, hold on, I've got to do my reviewer. There's your thumbnail. I just can't figure out why this phone even exists. And then it goes on to be a reasonably good performer. Uh, I mean, in terms of sales, people seem to like it. I have a whole family, a chunk of my family on Pixel 3a's and Pixel 4a's. Like, it's not a surprise. You want a Google badged phone at half the price of, of like your nicer iPhones. That's pretty easy to grok. Why might people enjoy this experience? But see, that's not how tech reviewers can think. They can't compartmentalize different types of phones for different people. They can only express through popularity this is the phone you should buy because everyone else is buying it, and I'm confirming the bias of my audience, while all these people try and debate whether or not they're unbiased. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> Let me see if I can catch up on the chat here. So we can, we can chat. I mean, we can talk about uh, what's going on here. Um... Well, that's absolutely clear. I heard that on the 6A, an unregistered thumb can open the lock screen. All right. I've trained both of my thumbs. So let's try unlocking the phone with... A f I have not scanned any of my pointer fingers. Um, any of my fingers. I've scanned my thumbs. I haven't scanned any of my fingers. So let's try... Nope. Nope. Oh, nope. Took me right to putting in my pin. Let me put in my pin. Let's try another finger. We're doing it live because apparently people can't figure out how fingerprint scanners work. I'm not going to do my middle finger because that would be rude on stream. Nope. Nope. And right back to my, my pin. I feel like my predictions on this bore out in the best possible way. 
the Pixel 6 Pro, I still think has a pokey fingerprint sensor, but it's gotten more reliable, right? It's not fast, but I haven't had as many issues where I've got a like multiple scan. It just does that slow pulse when it registers that your thumb is on the screen and then pulse to unlock the phone. Um, the 6A is demonstrably more consistent and faster at unlocking the screen. So this is not top tier fingerprint sensor performance, but let's be fair, Samsung doesn't have top tier fingerprint sensor performance. The, the winner is Vivo. If you want top tier fingerprint sensor performance, you need this absolutely monster fingerprint sensor, which is stupid fast at unlocking the phone. This, where it, it almost doesn't matter where on the bottom quarter of the screen you put your thumb, any part of it, I, like I just touched a, like a far corner of the fingerprint right there. Instantaneous unlock. Samsung has also fallen behind the top tier fingerprint sensor readers. But at mid-ranger prices, the, the, the thing that's really gonna beat it are the Xiaomi's. So any power button fingerprint sensor is gonna be wildly faster than any optical in display fingerprint sensor. I feel like the 6A is in good territory. It's not the best, and it does sort of a secondary pulse just like the 6 and 6 Pro, but I would also hope that means it's doing any kind of scan to make it more secure. At least that might be what I feel the trade-off are. Uh, McCorkering, go look it up, man. He's asking, where are these, where are these trade-in deals? I have a Pixel, a Pixel 3 and a Pixel 4a lying around. I'm assuming that the people that are most aggressive with these kinds of trade-in deals are going direct to Google. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to take a drink of coffee. I am not caffeinated enough. <laughs> Man, I got to catch up on the on the tech here. Yeah, RJ, I mean, really, it's the only good advice, right? Some big tech tuber said that the Samsung A53 has wireless charging, and that makes it more betters for the money when, in fact, when it, in fact, does not have it. I, I love, there was also another big-time YouTuber who was like, yeah, I really like the glass back. <laughs> and you're like, boy, is that not glass. <laughs> so, again, I, I feel like there is... Um, there's an issue with consistency. Uh, the type of examination given to a product that will more likely score better popularity points on YouTube search seems to get more attention, more in-depth commentary, you know, sort of a greater focus on what the, the product does well, the, the, the good features, and, and they, they write off the, the cons. You know, they, oh, I mean, it's a, it's a bummer that this phone doesn't have this thing, but you, you get used to it. Whereas a less popular device, which won't make as much money on its own, only seems to get reviewed in the context of, why should you buy a Samsung instead of this product? Or why should you buy an iPhone instead of this product? It's not a, a review of the Pixel 6a. It's a video telling Samsung and Apple owners why they were smart to not buy a Pixel 6a. And that to me is, is an agenda. That to me is a particular focus on bias to, to have the conclusion in mind first. They already know what the conclusion is going to be. It's that pixels aren't popular enough, you should buy iPhones and Galaxy. So that's the conclusion. So now we need to find the evidence to support that conclusion. This wasn't a fair assessment of what this product is. Because this, this does redefine what the A-series pixels are. And that can be problematic for some people. I'm not saying this is all roses. This isn't a one-to-one -one massive improvement. There are changes that happen when we mess around with the tier of SOC. So when we start putting hot rod components into a mid-priced phone, I'm sure people in this chat on, on, on Twitch and on YouTube can, can maybe imagine what some of those compromises might be. Let's say you took a phone like the Pixel 5a and you compare it against a phone like the Pixel 6a, immediately off the top of your head, what do you think might be a major compromise 
for the Pixel 6a compared to its predecessor. Let, let's see if anyone here in the chat might be able to imagine a potential change that consumers might not like when we're looking at two similar tiers of price on, on phones. Uh, from Muppinish, uh, back in the day, the YouTube creators could publish a video of a talking fruit. <laughs> oh, whoa, ha, how ha, ha, has YouTube changed? Um, <laughs> uh, this is hilarious. Yeah, I, I just demonstrated this. Rocky, uh, you, you got to go back in the stream. I'm not going to do it again. Asking multiple fingerprints working, which are not registered. Is that the case with yours as well? So, Someone tell Rocky what we actually did on stream. <laughs> um, let me get this down. I'm, I'm trying to get this out of here. Uh, both of my thumbs are registered. So there's no point in me doing a, a non-registered thumbprint because I train both of my thumbs because I'm not ambidextrous, but I use my phone with both hands. Why would you not train both of your thumbs? I know, I'll train one thumb and then show you what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, yes, they bandito. If one wants a bad fingerprint sensor, you can try the Nokia 9 Pure View. The LG Velvet was only slightly better also. That is one of my least favorite biometric security uh, solutions, but I need to see, let me get this down. I'm way behind on this chat. You guys are moving fast. I love it. And yeah, you guys are still talking about fingerprint sensors. Like I did it on camera scrub back on the podcast. I'm going to start muting people who are like, Oh no, try it with another thumb. Like, do you want me to pull out a big toe? Like, what is it that you are looking for? I tried it with multiple fingers and got to a pin. Oh, Michael. Hey, thanks for the super chat. Here, let's pull this up. Uh, PBK reviews teardown of a 6A is interesting. He removes a plastic back plate, shows, showing how flexible it is. Also shows all the heat management on the chip. That is a much better... Um, again, a proper teardown video as opposed to, I wonder if I can snap it and break it if I try with my hands as hard as I can. Um, <laughs> up in yes, toe security. Toe security is priority number one. <laughs> try it with your nose. <laughs> I feel like you guys are, are picking different body parts to eventually arrive at a body, body part that will get me removed from the internet. <laughs> so no we're not doing all of that i i i i feel like we're we're arriving at such a hyper specific example of a singular test case for someone complaining and demonstrating oh i was able to unlock it with something else. cool i can't it doesn't it does not respond to any of my other fingers and that's the other thing that I would I would ask is like at what point were these tests conducted because this is still not quite public facing software here let me pull up um, like I don't even think I'm I'm on a current security patch here so let me see about the phone where is my software Android 12 Android security update April 5th Google Play system update June 1st so anyone who's really digging into this for the hardcore deep dive review, especially if they had their phone before they were sent to Team Pixel, is not only not running current software, but those videos were shot before we got a flurry of app and security updates, a ton of individual apps in Google Play. All of the Google system apps were updated significantly after the Team Pixel folks got their phone. So unless we had some kind of accounting for when the major YouTubers, the people who had the phone for a week before I got it, I doubt they were shooting those videos the day of the release where a whole ton of software on this phone changed. But it's still not current because this is still not technically in consumers' hands yet. So if there's not that kind of nuance in the conversation regarding the phone, then I feel that big time YouTuber has done a humongous disservice 
because that is not how consumers will be using the device. From here, now we're going to see what the actual consumer experience is going to look like. Once the phone starts shipping, I'm expecting I'll get some kind of OTA to catch this thing up so that I'm not running security software that's, what, three, almost four months out of date. And that's what we're talking about when we say, oh, you should be able to be unlock the phone with your toe. Like, I would expect there to be a few little gremlins and stuff like that. And even for a few of those little gremlins, the fingerprint sensor performance has been head and shoulders better than where we were at the Pixel 6 launch. So this is what I mean, like, we're getting hyper fixated about what might be the deal breaker on the 6A instead of talking about what the 6A does really well. I need you all to focus and think, what is it that I'm trying to contribute to the conversation if all I can think about is, how does this phone fail? Because it really doesn't in many ways. I want to get back to that question that I was pointing out. Um, this is why I'm starting to feel like this is more of a, a hot rod flagship killer than it is a proper mid-spec mid-ranger. It's like, um, oh, I don't know if I still have it on my, oh, it's right here. So this is the IQ Neo 6. This has a Snapdragon 870. Depending on region, it sells in roughly the 4 to 450 dollar territory, again, accounting for exchange rates and local currencies. This is what we now understand internationally. You know, phones like um, the Poco X4 GT, which I have on loan to another reviewer. He's, uh, he's playing with my Poco X4 GT. We understand these phones as being compromised in some ways, but having a much more powerful SOC to, to make up that compute and gaming experience. So when we look at something like the Pixel 5a on a Snapdragon 765 and we look at the Pixel 6a on a Tensor 2, this would be my pick for people who want the more traditional smartphone experience, headphone jack, and better battery life. This would be my pick for a phone that in some benches can outperform the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. This is an incredible performer that's giving me glimpses of the Pixel 4 XL, especially once you start chewing up image data. You're chewing up photos and videos. This phone is going to run warm, and it's going to get the job done faster than almost any other device on the market today, including phones that cost three to four times more. So what do you want? This is not one-to-one. -one. You do not pick up this phone and say, this is an immediate successor, so it must be betterer in every single way. If I know someone doesn't need the compute power, this phone still exists in a strong way for me to offer as a solution if all they care about is the battery life. That's what you're going to pin it on. This is the better option for that. If you're looking at something that's going to handle much higher uh, graphics intense gamings, or if you want to start dabbling with vlogging or shooting TikToks, editing video on the fly, maybe you want to spruce up some of the photos on a more, uh, a more feature complete photo editing app. Maybe you want to record podcasts. This is one of the fastest podcast mixing solutions on the market today, including laptops. It can, it can chew up an hour of podcasting with bumpers and edits and ad breaks faster than my old gaming PC. <laughs> so this is now the conversation we're engaged with. And, and if you guys want to chat about that, that's great. If you want to just stay focused on a fingerprint sensor, then I feel bad for you. I do, because that's lame. <laughs> um, again, if you're sitting here and saying there's an objective purchasing solution to be had, I don't even know if, I, I think I maybe put it back away. I had the iPhone SE out here. Oh, here, it got it in the, uh, the wiener dog case. Anyone who can straight face look at you and say, well, uh, Apple sells an iPhone for under $500. You should get the, the iPhone instead of a Pixel is horrifically bad at their job. Sure, there are reasons why someone might want the SE over um, a Pixel 6a. But there is no benchmark, there is no real world or real life situation where this phone is a better phone than this phone. Again, I would 
seriously worry about the decision-making capabilities and the ability to deliver good advice to consumers if this is the pick over this. Um, it's pretty bad. <laughs> All right, I said it. People who keep harping on about the fingerprint sensor when I already showed it on camera, we're gonna start putting uh, users in timeout. <laughs> yeah, BG Tech Live. I'm playing Apex Mobile on the 6A right now. That's hilarious. Um, McCorker in three, but the fact is the Pixel 6A has more horsepower than any budget Android phone in the US market and arguably the best cameras on any budget phone. And that's kind of the point that I'm trying to get at. Um, I do a whole series of benchmarks and tests. I didn't pull up my own website. Let me, let me do this here real quick. Um, cause I did a breakdown on the, uh, the eight gen one because I have the Xiaomi 12 S ultra now, and I wanted to spend some time, um, comparing eight gen ones so that now we have the new eight plus gen one. Uh, if you're on the Patreon, I've already put out my benchmarking scores for the 12S Ultra. Excuse me. Man, those coffee burps, man, they get you. So I, I want to I wanna pull this up here for the screen share. And it is. So these are all the HN ones, and I've got sort of lists of benchmarks that I perform. So we start with some Geekbench, because Geekbench does not ever predict real-world app performance. So I can show a phone with like an incredible Geekbench score, but then it's sort of a mediocre performer in a real world app. We do video rendering, we do video transcoding, we do podcast mixing, we do video stabilization, synthetic file compression, uh, we do batch photo processing is now the most brutal test that I run, just tons and tons and tons of files. The Pixel 6a is now the absolute fastest Android I've ever tested in video transcoding for both PowerDirector and KineMaster. Now, why is that important? I'm using a big fancy word like transcoding. I run two different video tests. One video test is a whole bunch of clips stuck together with transitions. That makes the GPU work a little harder, managing like a fade effect in between every clip. And in that, that also has a watermark and uh, an audio bed. Like I've got a music file that's playing underneath all of those clips. That is a rich multimedia project that's more in line with a YouTube creator who's wanting to cut and splice clips together. It's a more aggressive kind of video performance test. The video transcode is a much simpler test. I take a, a two and a half minute video clip and I just reduce the bit rate. I just cut it in half. So why do that? That test is more in line with the, the average user who's only going to cut the head and tail on a single video. So editing is more than just one thing. Complex and rich editing is fades and transitions and, and watermarks and music beds and mixing audio levels and all that stuff. The vast majority of people who need to edit a video are going to take a single video clip and then maybe just cut off the tail, maybe they'll, you know, cut it in half, maybe it's two takes on one clip, so they just sort of scrub out the stuff that they don't need, but they're not stapling a whole bunch of things together. The Pixel 6a is now the fastest phone I've ever tested at chewing up the image data of a single video clip. It is upper mid-pack for the rich video editing in, in, my, in my render test. So it's hanging with and outperforming some of the phones out there with eight Gen 1s in a complex multimedia file. It is 10 to 15% faster at a single video clip than any other phone that I've benchmarked or reviewed. And that includes phones that are three times the price of the Pixel 6a. And if you're telling me that a Galaxy A53 in any way, shape, or form is a better buy because it has a 120 hertz display, but you're okay with a miserable Exynos SoC that will definitely lag and stutter through the 120 hertz of the UI, but somehow that feels faster when on 120 hertz it skips when opening my app drawer, <laughs> um, then again, I think you're objectively bad at tech and you can't 
understand why different people might want different things. And maybe you should just go into fashion marketing. Like if it's just about the label and you just want to show off the purse, then show off the purse, but don't make that an objective purchasing recommendation for people who might want one of the fastest phones of the year. One of the other tests I run is uh, that podcast mix down. And the podcast test has actually been one of the better sort of predictors of generational improvements. Whenever we jump to a new SOC, audio evolution seems to enjoy that extra compute power. When we say things, you're like, oh, the, uh, the Snapdragon 888 to the 8 Gen 1, we saw about 10% improvement to CPU processing speeds. Uh, audio evolution actually demonstrates that pretty well. Generationally, you can see kind of like a block of every phone. Not every phone performs exactly the same, but you see the, the performance in blocks. So 865s, they all have their own sort of window. And then you go up to the 888, and there are some 888s that are close to the 865, and then there are some 888s that are significantly faster than the 865s. And then there's another block when you get up to the 8 Gen 1. The Tensor, which again, this is now, the, the, the Tensor that we're talking about here was originally designed to battle with the Snapdragon 888 and it got delayed and it became sort of the window on the Pixel 6 Pro, it kind of became the window of SOC that sort of competed against both the 888 and the 8 Gen 1, you know, that overlap. It's a very similar to like Apple SOC overlap, but it, it kind of got pushed a generation later than it probably should have. That being said, the core configuration on the Tensor in the Pixel 4a and in the Pixel 6 Pro, I mean, Pixel 6a and Pixel 6 Pro, it ties the Moto Edge Plus and the Honor Magic 4 in the podcast mix down. Those are my two fastest phones that run on the 8 Gen 1 for this podcast mix down. Um, well, no, I'm sorry. The fastest, ultimate fastest is the, uh, the, the Axon 40. That is silly fast performance for $450 in an example of high performance computing straight out of your pocket. I, I, I am so unimpressed with, well, I ran a Geekbench and it got a lower number than another phone that also ran a Geekbench and had a higher number. And if you don't do anything on your phone but run Geekbench, then cool. Go get the phone that had the bigger Geekbench. But if you're actually trying to use your phone for anything, there are reasons why you might want to step up to that higher tier of compute power. I feel there is a difficulty in expressing that for the average consumers. I don't believe there is an average consumer. I believe everyone has unique reasons for why they pick the phone that they should pick, or they have unique needs that would probably be better served by phones that they did not buy. The consumer facing side of this is a lot less sexy. It's not as interesting. It's, um, uh, it's unifying Google's code and hardware. Google now has the complete vertical control over the hardware and software. We can promise more software updates and better security patching over a longer period of time. There's a commitment to three operating system updates. Maybe there will be more, probably not. But five years of security patching to me is so much more important than whether or not you get Android, what, 18? I don't care about that as much, especially on a $450 phone. So we've been clamoring for this. We've been asking Google, give us the, the same kind of software support that we should expect from an iPhone, right? And so now we're getting it. And the first complaint is, no, oh, but it doesn't have 120 hertz. And that is such a, a silly and specious complaint. Um, Oh, MC, I'm sorry to hear that. Again, I'm picking on manufacturers. I don't want people to feel bad about their phones, but MC writes, my goodness, don't get me started on the A53. I have it. I dislike it very much. Such a disappointment. If you can, if you can flip it for an A52, I think the A52 experience is, is noticeably better. Uh, so much so that Samsung still sells the A52 for a higher price than the A53. <laughs> 
Uh, Steve Litchfield, this is still an issue. Okay, so this is, uh, if you're an audio nerd like I am, does the 6A have the same speakers and audio chain as the 6 or 6 Pro? Um, I, I would say speaker performance is pretty close. I am, I, I still, what, what I need to do is a proper recording clean room test. And I think you'd be able to hear differences between the two, literally just because of the shape of the phones. Um, supposedly, the USB audio chain should have been fixed in the last major Pixel feature drop, but I'm still not seeing full, full high-res support on my THX Onyx. Now, I've got a bunch of other DACs. It takes so long to record samples and measure output and look at all of the, the variance between different um, audio solutions. So I haven't done that. I have not had the time to measure every single DAC I have to see if it's a one-off issue with the, the Onyx as that, you know, is sort of one of my go-to USB DACs or if it's something consistently an issue with the Pixel 6. But the 6a is very much like the 6 Pro uh, in how it handles one specific USB DAC. So that's, that's kind of a bummer. Uh, Sean, uh, have you tried the recorder app on the 6A to see if the transcription of text is any good? Not only have we tried it, we did it live on our Pixel unboxings. So if you catch my channel or TK's channel, TK just sort of started rambling on screen, setting up the phone brand new out of the box. It's identical to uh, Pixel 6 and 6 Pro. And that's what we want. That's why it's important that we're moving to a tensor in the mid-range. Google now has complete control over the hardware, software, and services combination. They are not reliant on Qualcomm. They don't have to license Qualcomm for extended support for longer-term software patching. There's none of that in the relationship anymore. Google owns it, for better or for worse. Google owns it. When there are problems, the buck stops at Google. They can't blame Qualcomm anymore. But we now have a $450 phone that services-wise is identical to the Pixel 6 Pro. If you want the best calling features on a smartphone, you got to go Pixel. All of the sort of uh, management, you know, so that you can put another call on hold. You can make someone wait for you until you're ready to answer the phone. You can get text transcription of all of the menus when you go through like your pharmacy. That's the biggie for me is like my pharmacy constantly changes. You know, they say like, and make sure you listen to your options because they may have changed since the last time you called. They change it like every single time. And it writes out everything as the computer voice is reading is, I don't have to sit there and really pay attention. I can kind of glance, oh, I need to hit three, you know, and then I can kind of get on with a call till I can speak to an actual human. The best on device speech to text transcription I've ever seen, works without a data connection, the best real time uh, uh, closed captioning. So you can pull up a video that doesn't have subtitles and it will in near real time create subtitles for you. The speech to text on a pixel is better than what YouTube uses to create closed captioning for your videos. I wish I could just play my video on a pixel and record the text and then upload that as my own subtitles, it would be better. It is consistently better than what YouTube serves. Um, the best assistant features, and I still feel it's the absolute best point and shoot camera layout, camera app. It, it, it really is so easy to use. I, I can't imagine handing another camera to family and friends. Like when they want the, I just want it to, it just works. And I pull it out and all I do is push the shutter button. And you're like, yeah, get a pixel. That's it. <laughs> and now it does better with the, uh, the 60 frame per second 4K video. Still runs warm because now we're on a, a hotter, you know, double X1 core SOC, but it's better. <laughs> Yeah, and McCorkerin, again, it's all about moving the goalposts. Uh, Michael writes, I love how people are referring, referring to this as the 60 hertz controversy. It's an effing controversy, even though the best-selling iPhone still has 60 hertz. Again, an $800 iPhone, 60 hertz is not a deal breaker. 
it's fine. I mean, if you want 120 hertz on an iPhone, you just spend more. And then you take that 120 hertz iPhone and you use that in a video against the $450 Pixel 6a to show why 120 hertz is better, right? So we link the idea of premium to Apple. And then at the end of the video, we hold up and Apple sells a phone that's close to the price of the Pixel. Do you see how insidious that is? You've sold Apple equals premium and Apple is better than Android at a three to one price difference. You've given Apple a three to one price advantage. And then at the end of the video, you conflate the really expensive iPhone with an iPhone that in no way, shape or form relates to the performance of the iPhone Pro. But you've already linked Apple equals better in the minds of your viewers earlier in the video. And now you can make a purchasing. I mean, why would you buy us a Google phone when you can buy an Apple phone for for even a little bit less? It's it's like twenty dollars cheaper than a Pixel 6a. And that to me is horrific. Like that is one of the most cynical exercises I think a YouTube creator could engage with in messing with the perception of products online. You are, now you've gone from just being sort of woefully you know, uh, beholden to YouTube metrics to making a purchasing recommendation that consumer, that might harm consumers. Like that is, that, that might not be the experience that they need. But you've told them that Apple equals better. And that, that's shocking to me. <laughs> Ted, oh, we're not going to do that. Ted says, it seems like 2022 might be the time tech enthusiasts drop Geekbench as a metric of measurement like we dropped DXO Mark. Unfortunately, way too many reviewers sort of stop with those scores. Um, those scores are meaningless. They do not tell you anything about real world performance. Um, I used to kind of lean on DxO as sort of the, well, I mean, let's just get kind of a lay of the land. Let's see what they say about the camera. And increasingly, as you see how low level they really test with like the most basic auto mode only kinds of performance metrics, it is not uh, in any way an insightful look at what the full capabilities of a smartphone camera might be. And same thing, Geekbench, I think they've been trying to do good work. Geekbench is trying to keep their performance charts from being too manipulated. Like they pulled uh, Galaxy results because Samsung was manipulating scores. They would let the phone run full performance on Geekbench, but then throttle performance on every other app on your phone. So I get it, but if Geekbench is that easy to manipulate, we can't rely on it as a purchasing recommendation type of uh, information. It is not reliable for that. So it, it, again, we need to be looking at what is the right product? What is the right solution? What are the pros and cons? And really listen to people to hear what is it that you need? I know people in my circle of family and friends who do not need the Pixel 6a. They don't need that horsepower. And they probably don't want it at the expense of what, roughly 10% of their battery life under normal average user use, while the Pixel 5a is still out there, especially now that they can probably get some good deals on Pixel 5a clearance, that's the right phone for them. And that's the phone I'm gonna recommend if they need a daily driver communicator. If you want something that can really start nipping at the heels of, of much higher priced devices and you care about some of the more advanced use that you can accomplish on a phone, the 6A is now becoming a very interesting option in the flagship killer space. I don't, I, I never imagined we'd be having this conversation where I'd be thinking of a Pixel A series in the same way that I think about Pocos and Icoos. Like the IQ Neo 6 rocked my socks. Snapdragon 870, $450, 256 gigs of storage. This thing's a monster. And if I had to pick a camera, I would definitely take the 6A <laughs> over the, uh, over the IQ. And then you start looking back and forth, like the Neo can win a few fights, but for some of that core heavy lifting, I feel it is likely someone on a pixel is like, it is probably more inclined 
to dig into some of the camera tech. So if you want to trim up a video that you shot on your Pixel, it is so fast trimming up that video on the Pixel. And it wins pretty handily against a powerhouse phone like that IQ Neo 6 with the Snapdragon 870. It has to be user and app specific. And when you get into that, it is so much more exciting to see where these, these performance improvements matter. Like, I'm not the biggest fan of the 8 Gen 1, but there are definitely some tests I can show where an 8 Gen 1 is an absolute screamer. And if that is something that you want to do with your phone, it's important that you know this is the phone you want to do it with. There's a reason why you might want to step up from an 855 or an 865 and get the 8 Gen 1 and get that kind of processing and performance. But we don't test phones like we do laptops, right? We just say, well, it's a phone and it's got an SOC, you know, like all phones and average consumers. But we don't talk about productivity phones versus gaming phones versus basic communicator phones versus multimedia phones. Maybe you need a phone just for video streaming. Maybe that's the thing. And you should absolutely avoid premium tier phones like the mother flippin' plague. If the core use of your phone is streaming video, you are grossly overspending and you're definitely not getting a better experience because that high performance SOC is going to eat into your battery life. You will stream less video. A multimedia phone depends on better battery life, better stability and better consistency. But we don't hear tech reviewers talking about phones like that. We don't hear tech reviewers trying to figure out what market this phone fits into and how two phones, even though they're called similar things with their product names, don't fit in the same category. These phones do not belong in the same bucket. These phones define different buckets, especially in North America where we don't have a lot of competition like this uh, in between four and five hundred dollars. I'm way behind on the chat again. <laughs> I'm real good at doing the, the lead conversation. <laughs> so Mike Shaw, I would seriously consider some of these like high performance mid rangers. Uh, my, my weird biggest complaint about some flagships is curved screens. Give me a flat screen on an S23 Ultra, please. I don't care about 120 Hertz. If you don't want curves and you don't care, about um, high refresh, shop the mid-range. Find some of these flagship killer mid-rangers. Maybe even import one if you're okay, maybe skipping back to LTE on T-Mobile. It's not gonna work on Verizon or AT&T anymore, unfortunately. But the Pixel 6a joins that conversation in a pretty big way. So we can't have, unfortunately, we can't have a unicorn device where it's got everything that you would possibly want. You've got to figure out the compromises you can live with. But if you want flat screen and high performance in the United States right now, it's Pixel 6a. If you want flat screen, high performance, faster refresh rate display, and a better main camera sensor, it's Pixel 6. I, you know, like, it, it's such a good value proposition right now. If you want the best telephoto, then you've got to go up to the Pixel 6 Pro. <laughs> oh, McCorkerin. Uh, after the Pixel 6 coverage, I basically purged all the lame SEO techies out of my feed. <laughs> um, let me get this down. I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm way behind. Yeah, Mike Shaw, call screening is so good. Um, McCorkerin, the astrophotography mode is pretty good. Um, the astrophotography mode on a Pixel is pretty good. I, I'm going to be the shill. Uh, I think when it comes to the, the most extreme application of low light and HDR processing, I've got to give the win to Vivo. The X80 Pro is basically indomitable. I, I was out last night, um, so I, I don't like talking about where I live. I, I don't know why I get like sort of persnickety about this, but like I was walking around with my cargo shorts, which now I'm starting to call my please don't mug me cargo shorts because I had the X80 Pro, the S12 Ultra, and the Pixel 6a 
all in my pockets at the same time. And you're like, I'm walking around with $3,000 worth of phones. Please, please, please. It's 11 o'clock at night. And if you've seen any of my videos and coverage, like there are parts of my neighborhood that get scary dark. Um, we're up in the hills. And, and it is not uncommon for me to also just like happen upon a couple coyotes. And they're not intimidated by people at all. <laughs> they are not scared of us. Um, so I'm walking around last night. It's 11 o'clock at night. I, I, I probably trek a good like three mile hike, just finding a few landmarks um, uh, uh, around my neighborhood. And the 12S Ultra is an absolute beast of a camera. And, and in straight like raw to raw um, file comparisons, like, yeah, the, the, the 12S Ultra is taking a lead over the X80 Pro. And then I turn on some of the computational abilities on the X80 Pro, like the, the night mode or the super raw feature. And it is unbelievable how much brighter and clearer that Vivo can produce an image. It is straight up voodoo. So while Google started us off on this computational photography um, train, I mean, the, 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 the photo and video performance on Pixels has gotten astoundingly good in the best kind of only push the shutter button kind of way. If you can fiddle with a few settings, I think Vivo has taken that next step. It is faster to process an image in near total darkness that can almost, be, almost look like daylight conditions when you finish it on the other side and when people complain i don't like my night photos to be too bright that again you're awful at tech because that's a dumb thing to say what we're talking about is making the cleanest sharpest prettiest possible image in the worst possible conditions the most extreme conditions that we can push a camera sensor to and you can make the photo darker or you can edit it or you can turn the exposure slider down to make the image dimmer. What we're looking at is the total raw capability of what that thing can do from a computational standpoint is mind blowing. So astrophotography on the pixels is very good. What you do with astrophotography on a tripod with a pixel can almost be matched handheld on a Vivo. So I didn't take a tripod out with me last night, so I couldn't do a direct comparison. I might try and do that tonight. Like that could be sort of a fun showdown. But what you put on the pixel, you put the pixel on a tripod and it can do like a two minute scan of the night sky. And then it produces this beautiful image, super clear, super low noise. I am almost to that point, hand holding a Vivo for like seven seconds. That's the sort of generational difference that we're seeing in some of this really extreme computational photography. Um, from Hassan, this is a great question. Um, uh, Haas writes, if this was already asked, I apologize, does the Pixel 6a get too hot outside? Right now, this is torture testing conditions for me in Southern California. Um, with a tensor, doing normal day-to-day -day phone stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, I should mention, we're, we're in the high 90s and we're peaking some low hundreds here in Southern California. So your ambient temperature is already elevated on the phone. And then you factor in like, it's got a decently bright screen. I've got a SIM card in there. The radios are going, the storage is going, the battery is heating up. It becomes kind of a heat sink because, not a heat sink, it, com it becomes a heat soak because the ambient air around the phone really can't help get heat out of the phone until the phone is hotter than the air around it. And once you climb to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the phone is already <laughs> running at its like thermal maximum, right? Like we get concerned once we start talking about like the inside chip running to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius, obviously. Um, so, Right now, I'm at that point where no phone can sustain heavy lifting activities for more than a couple minutes. No phone. Um, I had the Xiaomi 12S Ultra and the Vivo X80 Pro. I, I used both of them. I'm, I'm shooting a video on an electric bike. You know, a little, it's a little city commuter bike. It's got a little motor, it's got pedals, it's cute. Um, I needed both phones. Uh, I could get a couple minutes of, of short clips and then I would get the thermal warning and I would switch phones 
and go to the other phone and shoot a couple clips, switch phones, shoot a couple clips. I, I mean, like, there's, there's no phone, especially no premium tier phone that can sustain that. Um, as soon as you have sun on the phone and the phones running the cameras and the screens at its brightest, you've got minutes of 4K video shooting time. Like, that's, that's the gig. Uh, the Pixel 6a now fits in that territory. If you're shooting 4K 60 on a Pixel 5a, you have limited shoot time because that's a mid-ranger SoC. The only phone that did a good job with a Snapdragon 765 with 4K 60 frame per second video was the LG Wing, and that phone would get screaming hot. That was one of my heaviest used B-roll phones um, until the Pixel 6 Pro came out. I, I used that wing heavy. So much of my outdoor footage was shot LG wing. Um, and the 4K 60 frame per second video was great. The phone would be uncomfortable to hold. It would be so hot. and it, But it would sustain the clip. The Pixel, 5, uh, the Pixel 5a has a higher, or excuse me, has a lower threshold for warning you when the phone is running warm. Tensor is a different kind of performance conversation. Just because they're both called A-series pixels, they do not resemble each other in any way. So if your media creation needs are more like 1080p video, the Pixel 5a is gonna run much longer in hot outdoor conditions. Um, if you're talking 4K 60, the, they're probably pretty close. I would imagine they would both throttle and give you thermal warnings similarly, but for very different reasons. But if you're in a more temperature controlled environment, like right now it's about 70 degrees in my office, I'd be willing to bet, and I'm gonna try and do a test on this, I'd be willing to bet that the Tensor can probably outlast the, the Snapdragon 765 in a cool office shooting 4K 60. I think the best run that I ever had on the Pixel 5a was about 15 minutes. So under optimal conditions and purposely trying to set the screen brightness a little bit lower, I got 15 minutes in one complete chunk of 4K 60. I bet you the Tensor can probably do a bit better. But again, it, it's, it's not a question of too hot. It's about what our expectations might be. Uh, I, I caught, um, I forget who published it. Dang it. I don't think it was Android Authority. Anyway. Someone wrote up an article, I'm finally getting rid of my Pixel 6 Pro. Even though I love this phone, the bugs have gotten too bad for me. And like their main bugs, we're talking about performance issues, it runs too hot. And then their recommendation at the end of the article was, you know what I'm gonna do instead? I'm gonna get one of those Galaxy S22s. And you're like, if you think, oh, you sweet summer child, you. <laughs> that is like the most smooth brain thing you can say. If you think your performance issues are going to go away with an S22 or an S22 Plus, no. No, that's not the thing. <laughs> it's so silly. But again, we, we don't compare products like that. It's now just a part of the idea, pixels run too hot, have bugs. And then they only think of like S22 Ultra, excuse me, Note 22 reviews, and they forget that the S22 is built fundamentally different than the Note 22. So that S22 does not perform anywhere near the tier of the Note. It is a woefully compromised device that Samsung cut costs on. They cut corners to arrive at a lower manufacturing price to hopefully build in a higher profit margin. The S22 is not good. It is not a good phone. It is, it is a very bad performing phone. In my tests, I don't believe there is a single test that the S22 beats the Pixel 6a on. And that includes like my heaviest like batch photo processing, ridiculous, no one would really do this in real life, heavy lifting workload, thermal throttling test. Boy, howdy does the, the Pixel 6a stomp curb stomp the Galaxy S22. Hold on, I I'm gonna pull this up. Let me see if I can... I would normally save this for like an article or some kind of like exclusive commentary here, but um, let me pull up the benchmarks. 
I, I don't really publish the benchmark results like I used to. People wouldn't watch them on video, so. All right, so I just want to see. Time to completion was 1,100 seconds on the 6A, and it was 1,440 on the S22. The Galaxy S22 was 40% slower. Is that how you would say that? So if it took a thousand, if it, if it took almost 1100 seconds on a Pixel 6a and it took over 1400 seconds on a Galaxy S22, the S22 is 40% slower at the worst thermal throttling and thermal performance of the 6a. The fastest batch of the S22 was substantially slower almost 15% slower than the slowest batch on the Pixel 6a. In a file compression test, 892 to 946, it's closer, but the S22 is losing by roughly 10%. It's 10% slower. Uh, the podcast tests are almost identical, but for one minute of activity, an 8 Gen 1 can hang with the tensor. Uh, in a video render test. Yeah. So my, my video render test on PowerDirector is a minute long 4K video and it took the S22 a minute 50 to finish that test. The Pixel 6a did it in a minute 26. So neither phone was faster than the time it takes to play the video, but a 20 second difference on a one minute file is a pretty big delta for a video rendering, a video project. Um, the uh, video transcode test that I was telling you about took two, so the video file is two minutes and 30 seconds. And basically, as long as you're doing it faster than 2.30, you're in high performance zone. So the S22 does okay. It finished that video transcode in two minutes and 26 seconds. The Pixel 6a did it in a minute 52. So it did it like about 30 seconds faster <laughs> on a two and a half minute project file. If, if you're worried, oh, I'm worried, so worried about tensor and thermals and processing, and you're not comparing it to similarly priced Samsungs, then you're really missing out on what the difference in performance actually resembles. Um, you need to buy a Note if you want to beat the Pixel 6a in any kind of real-world application. That's not absurd advice but there aren't many people I know of who can walk into a store and just buy a Pixel 6a outright, but could also walk into a store and buy a Galaxy S22 Ultra outright. There's almost no audience overlap there. So if you want the most extreme high performance currently available in North America, if you want that, um, yes, there is a solution. In Android land, you've got to step up to a $1,200 phone. If you're okay losing a couple fights, you're pretty feature comparable at $450 now. And I feel that's an interesting conversation. This isn't the battery life champ. Ho, ho, no. Um, but this is now a, a hot rod mid-ranger. This is a crazy performant um, device. <clears throat> so, Hassan, uh, thank you for asking about thermals. <laughs> <laughs> kind of went off there. <laughs> uh, I'm way behind. Do, do, do. <laughs> Dimitri, but Juan, it is a iPhone. I like anyone, again, anyone, anyone saying SE over Pixel 6a. That is clown shoes. That's bad advice. I would seriously recommend not listening to that person ever again for any kind of objective, uh, objective advice. Uh, from Barry Johnson, great point. I didn't think we would be here. I assumed Vivo and Xiaomi would always be ahead of mid-rangers. Great job, Google. Again, I've got 
a, a Xiaomi 12S Ultra with a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. It is such a great step in the right direction for improving performance on Qualcomm powered phones. It does not win every fight. And a $450 Pixel beats it in a couple of very specific tasks. You can't tell me that's not stunning competition. But again, you have to care about what you can do on a phone. If you only make your reviews around the lowest common denominator knuckle-dragging idea of an average consumer, I just like to watch a Netflix and stream a TikTok, then you can stop shopping at $300. A $300 phone accomplishes everything that those people are testing on their $1,200 review devices. If you're not getting specific about different kinds of games, different kinds of apps, you will have no idea what phone will really be the best fit phone for your needs, because everyone has different needs. And that, to me, is where the 6A becomes a, a, a very interesting conversation because, boy, howdy, is it not a great fit for everybody. No phone is. But the 6A is targeting, ends up targeting, a different consumer block than the 5A did. And with both phones still in the ecosystem, there are people, I got to point them to the 5A, and then there are some people, man, you're really going to like what the 6A can do. Oh, MC, I, I haven't really found one yet. Uh, MC is asking, what dongle do you recommend for the Pixel 6a? You may have said something about it already. Just let me know. Um, I'll go back. I, I, I haven't tested them all. Um, I really want to try it with the periodic audio. I need to try it with the Helm Bolt. Um, I, I have like some of the Fios. I don't have the new Fio dongle, but I do have the Fio Q3. And I can, <clears throat> I can hook up their Bluetooth, um, their BTR5. I can use that as a dongle DAC. So far, I've only tried it with the THX Onyx. I, you know, like it's a $200 dongle DAC. Um, it's kind of silly. It's 50% the price of the phone. <laughs> I don't know that that's really the, the good target demo <laughs> for a Pixel 6a, but if you really want to turn any phone into a high quality multimedia um, DAP, um, that's why I tend to start with the THX. So far, it hasn't fully delivered the entire spectrum fre frequency response, everything that I would expect to see in, uh, you know, sort of 24-bit 96 kilohertz or 32-bit 192. Um, <laughs> so I, I haven't tested them out. I, ca I can't make a recommendation yet. Um... Digital slang, the size of the Pixel 6a is perfect, smooth so far, and does just about everything really well. My battery life hasn't been great, but I not, might not go back to my S22 Ultra. Again, I kind of feel if someone's saying, oh, I don't know about the battery life on the Pixel 6a, better go to a Samsung. That ain't it, Chief. Especially not if you're looking anywhere near the price. Like an S22? That ain't it, Chief. Man, that battery life is not good. <laughs> oh, 2Turbo, it's really fun. 2Turbo writes, can we talk about how cool the pocket operator for Pixel is that Teenage Engineering put out? I love making random little beats. It's so much fun. Um, I am a terrible musician. I used to try and cut original music for a lot of my uh, videos and stuff, and I'm really not great. I can kind of just paint you know, back from like the, uh, what was it, Sony Acid? Do you remember that software? You would just get clips and you just sort of paint with your clips. And it was super cute. You can kind of throw out some beats that way. Um, beyond any of that, I'm, I, I'm not. But it's fun to play with. It really is fun to play with. Uh, Dustadori, the only thing I'm bummed about going from the 5A to the 6A is the exclusion of the headphone jack. Other than that, I'm going to keep my LG G8 to the 6A as a daily driver and keeping my G8 as my multimedia device. Um, that is the best advice I could give if you're an old LG nerd like I am. Picking up an old LG, its second life as a media player is really good. Um, you can spend a lot of money on an Android-powered DAP digital audio player and 
it will probably scientifically outperform an old G7, an old G8, some of those uh, quad DAC phones. You are in hyper specific golden ear territory where a thousand dollar digital audio player can consistently beat quad DAC on an LG. And again, you got to be careful with your headphone selection. What's going to trip the uh, the um, the resistance, uh, the the headphone jack resistance, so you get the the louder amp. There are a few things that are a little clunky about using an LG as a DAP, but considering how cheap you can get a G8, <laughs> um, LG as a second life as a standalone media player is flipping phenomenal. So I think that's a good play. I mean, if you're going to look at a phone like the 6A as like your meat and potatoes, and then you can, you can augment that experience with a secondary device on the side that is solely there for uh, like music consumption and maybe watching and streaming some video, uh, it doesn't get better. It really doesn't get better than the price on, a, on an old refurbed LG. Oh, see, Justin, I'm so happy to hear this. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that part of my conversations have helped inform this. Justin writes, hey Juan, I love your content. I feel like with the more devices I've gotten, I've realized that while I once wanted the most powerful phone possible, I don't need it. Mid-range devices are perfect. A couple years back, I was of that mind where, man, if you don't get a flagship premium tier phone, you're punished for it. Like especially on like the older era of Snapdragon 400s. Those were miserable devices to use, had terrible cameras. You got great battery life, but it's like that old joke, like the food is terrible, but the portions are huge. Now, all of the tech that we're most excited about has trickled into the mid-range. Two to $300 gets you a perfectly functional daily driver communicating device. And a lot of them are pretty good at doing like multimedia streaming. You're not going to want to lean on them heavy. You're not going to play graphics intense games. You're not going to edit a lot of video on them, though many of them can edit and render 720p or 1080p video. You're not really going to want to do it, but they can. Two to three hundred dollars. Two to three hundred dollars, and we're already satisfying and exceeding average consumer use at like four to six hundred dollars your choices are monstrously capable. And again, you are still overkill for the vast majority of consumer uses. If you climb above $500, you need to start having specific reasons why you're climbing above $500. When you're making a purchasing recommendation to your family and friends, play this game and really listen to what they say they need and what they say they want. We've been doing this in my family now since the Pixel 3a, and it's been crazy fun. Do you need more compute power for your daily tasks? And most of my family has said, no, I really don't. So if you can achieve at least Snapdragon 835 levels of performance, your, your, your compute power needs are, are met. You don't need more compute power, but what do you get instead by sticking with like a Snapdragon 765? You get much better runtime. Those phones are still often paired with really big batteries. Well, isn't that what a lot of these average consumers are complaining about? They don't need to do more aggressive work on their phones. They want their phones to last longer out and about and away from a charger. So that's not the answer going up to an $800 plus device. The answer is sticking in the mid range. <laughs> it is better features for that user. They will like the phone experience better than spending premium tier cash. And then it's just a side benefit that they're saving money. I'm telling you like, my wife is on a Pixel 4a 5G. She came from an LG G7. My dad was on an S8 or S9, hated it. He's on a Pixel 4a. Uh, my brother was on an old beat up Huawei, went down to I, one of the Moto, uh, which one? It's the one that I reviewed too. 
It's one of the motos with like a 5,000 milliamp hour battery and a Snapdragon 730. Uh, my, my sister and her husband, Pixel 4a, Pixel 5a, they genuinely like what those phones do and it's just a perk that they spent less money to get it. That's the best game to play. And if you're not playing that game with your family, then I don't feel you're giving them great advice. Yeah, Farhan, I can agree with the X80 Pro's night mode. Even the Xiaomi 12S Ultra night mode doesn't win me over the Vivo. Um, and the night mode on the 12S Ultra is really good. The raw files on the 12S Ultra are really good. But it's a brains versus brawn kind of fight. Um, the larger camera sensor brute force wins some photo comparisons. And then the computational photography on the Vivo win other <laughs> fights. It's, it's stunning. It is stunning. <laughs> so from Miel V, my, my, my guess is they're playing the same misguided, uh, they're, they're trying to play the same misguided game that every other manufacturer has, has jumped onto since Apple did it. Because again, it's another thing that kind of bums me out is, uh, you know, I can hold up this Pixel 6a box and there's nothing to unbox. There's a cable and a USB-C adapter. I, you know, at this point, I wish you would not put in the USB-C adapter and you would give me a headphone adapter if you're going to take the headphone jack off the phone. Um, that's a bummer. I hate having to sort of, oh, you probably already own a charger. Make It's the charger that goes with the phone. And when I pick up a Poco, a Vivo, a Xiaomi, any of these other devices, they have specific chargers that maximize the charge potential of the batteries in their phones. You got to include that charger in the box. It's a better deal. It's a better experience. Uh, Miel writes, I wonder why they removed the headphone jack. It was an essential selling point, in my opinion. And they removed it because Apple made money on it. Apple made money by breaking a part of their phone and selling you a solution that was more expensive. And that's better for a company's bottom line. And now Google sells some great Pixel Buds. Like the Pixel Buds A-Series are really good. I'm going to try and get my hands on the Pixel Buds Pro. I, they're great. Um, but this unfortunately becomes a part of the game. Uh, you know, They save money by reducing packaging. They save money on some of the phone construction costs, moving pieces and parts around. And then it's up to the consumer to fill in the gaps that were removed. So that helps the bottom line the purchasing, the, the revenue, the attached sales to a major purchase like a smartphone. It sucks. And I wish anyone would have listened to me screaming out into the void when Apple started pulling this and we were all making fun of Apple for the courage to remove the headphone jack, but you can't beat Apple's marketing. Like I have a YouTube channel that no one shares videos on my YouTube channel I'm not gonna be able to unseat the billions of dollars a year Apple spends to condition their customers to think everything they do is a good idea. We're, we're gonna lose. I'm, I'm not gonna help us lose. I'm gonna fight and say, this is, there's, there are good reasons why you want these kinds of features, but even I can see the writing on the wall. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna win that fight against Apple. I'm just not gonna help them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Barry, Galaxy S22. Wow, that is horrible. So if you're using the Galaxy S22 as like a covering the basics kind of phone, like it's fine. You're going to get not good battery life and the performance tanks, but... You know, I would highly recommend picking up an S21 instead, uh, maybe an S20 FE, or I don't know about the S21 FE, but S22, I mean, there's, I, I still need to see if there was a follow-up. Yeah, Barry Johnson, that was a device that the South Koreans wanted to sue for. I don't know if there's been any traction on the class action lawsuit in South Korea, um, but the, the consumers out there were so upset about the performance, and that was with the Qualcomm version of the S22. Even on their home turf, Samsung does not sell the Exynos version of the S22. Um, 
they, uh, I don't know if that's moved forward. I should look it up. I, I like bringing it up, though, that they, tr they, they at least tried. Samsung owners on Samsung's home turf in Samsung's home country were so disappointed with the S22, they're, they were trying to sue Samsung for how bad that thing performed. Uh, from Hassam Wan, are you planning on getting the Asus Zenfone 9? I am. I'm going to be way late. I have so much stuff to kind of chew through. I need to finish up Axon coverage. I need to finish up Honor coverage. I'm just digging into the S12, uh, 12S Ultra, and now the Pixel 6a. Man, that Asus looks so good. It looks like such a great little option in this space. I... It's going to be a bit <laughs> before I can get to it. <laughs> yeah, see, BG Tech Life, I mean, like, this is, this is what we're talking about. I'd rather have a great processor and 60 hertz over a trash pro processor and 120 hertz. That equals a dumpster fire. I really like Redmi's and Poco's, but you can throw 120 hertz on a low-level media tech, and boy, do you not really get 120 hertz the screen is only a benefit if the surrounding device is is capable now i know the tensor is capable because i've got a pixel 6 pro sitting in front of me too but if i've got to make a compromise and i know i'm probably going to want to try and tweak a few things to maximize battery life i have zero qualms recommending a 60 hertz pixel against a 60 hertz iphone 13. <laughs> oh, ER1980. Again, some of them won't, though. That's what, that's what gets me so persnickety. Uh, just like the Pixel 3a, 4a, and 5a, give it six months and the same clowns will be praising it that, that are all crapping over it right now. I, I remember it was, um, what was it, Lou, Unbox Therapy. There was that one clip of his podcast where he had the Pixel 3a. I just don't understand, like, why this is getting such positive reactions from people. You know what it is? It's like Google's a good marketing company. That must be what it is. That's why people seem to like the 3A. And you're like, it could just be that the 3A was a baller phone that redefined mid-ranger phones in the United States. Maybe it was just a really good phone. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe your initial assessment panning the phone was, I don't know, incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so McCorkran says if you're not driving expensive headphones, you're probably good with Google's proprietary dongle and then immediately digital, digital slang. The periodic audio dongle is good. I mean, it's a little pricier than a lot of our, you know, like an iPad dongle is 10 bucks, $9, I think. Um, but the periodic dongle is is pretty nice. I like periodic. They're really funky, boutique audio nerds. So uh, they're, they're fun to, uh, to kind of play around with. Guys, you guys have just, just slaughtered me on this chat. I'm, I'm trying to sort of scan through some of these right here. Um, Farhan, the LG Velvet 5G shows that you don't need flagship tier chipset for productivity, productivity focused functionality. Um, we're never gonna get a feature complete phone like the Velvet ever again. Um, Let's see. So this this is, I mean, we can kind of chat about some of this. As wireless charging becomes common outside the tech space, vehicles are starting to include this feature. Do you think it should be considered for the 7A? Um, I have a hard time with wireless charging. I, I have to be very, because I'm totally solo. I'm not part of an outlet. I don't have other editors. I'm not working with the team. We don't have to share an opinion. Um, so on my channel, what you get is tech commentary heavily filtered through my bias. And I've even made videos. I am going to tell you upfront what I like, what I use, how I use my devices, and this is why I come to the conclusions that I do. Um, and, and again, I'm always going to be sort of a zealot for competition in general. I was one of those nerds during the Lumia days who couldn't shut up about Qi charging. 
wireless charging, wireless charging. You need the wireless charging. I have phones within reach that were like the precursors and, and like the most important. And you don't even have to plug it in. You can just wirelessly charge it. Over time, I don't feel wireless charging has really risen to the consumer expectations that I was putting on it when it was first introduced. Um, it is very easy. <clears throat> it is very easy to improperly charge a phone over Qi coils. Uh, I mean, two years ago, I was sharing some of the scientific studies on phone charging rates. And if you don't perfectly align the coils on your phone with the coils in a wireless charging pad, wireless charging becomes phenomenally wasteful, like 30 to 40% more power used than what gets put into your phone, which then just generates significant amounts of additional heat. It's the one nice thing I can say about MagSafe is putting magnets on a Qi charger removes some of the user error of improperly aligning coils and pads. I'm still not a fan. Um, when you look at the Honor, the Honor Magic 4 has support for up to 100 watt wireless charging, but you can't use the 100 watt charger with the wire with the the chi charging pad to get 100 watt wireless charging where all of that wattage really is making it to the phone you need to buy a 130 watt wireless charger that's how much wasteful energy goes into high performance chi charging the numbers aren't quite as severe obviously if you're talking about like 10 watt but that's also what bothers me. I have a 15 watt motor roller charger. I've got the Nomad. The Nomad wireless charging base is really nice. It's beautifully constructed, has these pads. Your phone sits in there perfectly. All the way back to like my old five watt Nokia wireless charger. No matter what wattage I use, if I put a phone on any of these Qi chargers and let it charge a significant chunk, like at least 20 to 30% of the battery, it comes off that charger noticeably warmer than if I plug in a OnePlus on a 65 watt warp charge. And that 65 warp charge can tackle 50% of that phone battery in like 10 minutes. It's stupid fast and you arrive at a cooler phone at the end of that charging experience. My eye is twitching, is how much I dis disapprove of wireless charging. So my liberal angst delivers a twofold issue with wireless charging. It runs your phone hotter, which degrades battery life faster over time, and it's more wasteful than a good, proper spec cabled charger which can significantly charge your phone significantly faster over the same period of time while running the battery cooler while doing it. So I personally don't see where in the mid range, if I have to make a few compromises, that wireless charging is a significant deal breaker. And I continue to speak with my family and friends. Like if you buy a newer phone and you want to mount it in your car, I would recommend going with a vent if, if your car can support a vent mount, then when it's hot, because again, it's going to be 100 degrees <laughs> in Southern California, through parts of Southern California today, um, I can't leave my phone on the windshield. It's too hot. The, the heat radiating off of my windshield, I'm gonna, the screen's going to dim, the, the CPU's going to throttle, performance is going to tank, the radios are going to die, and it doesn't matter what phone I pick in front of me. Like, all of them are going to perform like garbage. So I've moved to a vent. I don't want to add additional heat with a wireless charging solution. But if I pop a phone on an AC vent and I plug it in, I can, I can slow charge. The phone runs cool. The phone continues to operate, and I've got active cooling <laughs> on the phone. It's such a silly consideration, but that's like, it's a computer. It's a computer with passive cooling. Even the M2 MacBook Air 
can throttle down to the point of an M1 MacBook Air. Because <laughs> there's no active cooling. So yeah, um, I, I don't feel it's an issue. But again, I, I feel like we've done a massive disservice to consumers by not expressing what are the pros and cons. There's a convenience, yeah, I take my phone and I go boop, and then the phone lights up and it tells me it's charging. Cool, but Americans, boy, do they not know what fast charging really is. 100 watts on my Honor, I've got 80 watts on my Vivo, 65 watts on the uh, Red Magic, on the 12S Ultra, on um, the OnePlus 10 Pro. Like, Apple and Samsung pretending to have fast charging is laughable, it's ludicrous, and people don't even know how bad it really is because, you know, OnePlus doesn't spend $10 billion a year marketing their brand. I'm not exaggerating. That's how much Samsung sp spends telling people they exist. <laughs> Samsung spends more on their marketing than most phone manufacturers spend on their entire phone manufacturing operation. <laughs> Way behind on the chat, doo doo do. Man, we've been burning this like Pixel Six A. You guys are, you guys are jumping in here. I, I love it. Um, <laughs> Keystone, no SD card storage. What's next? I mean, like what? No speakers, no screen. You can all pay for that extra, right? <laughs> You're just gonna get a box. Your box is permission to keep using the phone you already own. <laughs> That'll be next. Yeah, Apple will do it first. <laughs> oh, and Adichie, yeah, periodic rhodium, straight up fire. It's a very clean sound, doesn't really add any EQ of its own. It's really good. I was very impressed with the, the periodic audio. Again, especially as that kind of middle point. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's not premium tier, and it delivers great audio playback. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess Keystone saying wireless is good as long as you don't get cheap chargers. Um, like, I, you know, I've, I've got the OnePlus. I have the OnePlus, you know, warp wireless charger. That's warmer than using 65 watt warp plugged in. Um, I, I have the Nomad. I've got the Moto. I'm trying to think if I've got any others. And I've got like some $20 wireless charging pads from Costco. I guess they're not as good. But, like, the difference between that $20 Costco wireless charging pad, or it was a two-pack, 20 bucks for two wireless chargers. So it's a $10 wireless charger versus the Moto wireless charger is not much different. And every single time I go to, let me charge this on the first party. This is the brand. They, they say, this is what we're going to, what we're going to showcase is our best foot forward for wireless charging. The cable charging is always faster and cooler with less wasted power. And so I guess like you can make wireless charging better. I don't think you can make wireless charging comparable to wired charging. It's always going to be behind. It's kind of like, hey, if you're a serious gamer, yeah, you can game over Wi-Fi, but if you want the absolute best data connection and consistency and lowest ping that your internet can deliver, you game over a cable. So there's a convenience to wireless charging. I just plop it down on this charger. But if you want the best charging, you still need to plug in a cable. <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to pick up with... I missed a tech loving mama. Oh, there we go. I don't like how slow wireless charging is compared to just using a wire. I also don't like more often than not how it makes my devices too warm, sometimes too hot. Um, I, I had a scary, I, I want to say it was, it might have been the V50. So I think it was the V50 on Sprint. And I plopped it down on, I think it was one of the less expensive wireless pads. And you're like, oh, oh, this phone is hot. Um, and ever since then, I've been really skeptical of wireless and fast wireless. 
Yeah, Michael, absolutely. Fast wireless charging is still the Wild West. It's five watt, default is five watt for Qi charging. Each maker has different rates and settings for fast wireless. Apple is 7.5, Samsung is 10. I believe Moto is 15. Google is 11 or 15. LG was 15. I think technically, if you can find the right combination of wall plug, charger, and cable, I believe the Pixel 6 Pro can charge just a hair faster over wireless than it can over wired. Because Google's fast charging is just as specious as Samsung and Apple's fast charging. It's like 30 watt, but it kind of peaks at like 22. But there's a wireless charger. I can't remember which one, but I think there is a wireless charger that can get the, the Pixel up to like 25. So it's like, it's 10% faster wirelessly charging. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. I, again, I'm like, I'm not impressed. It's not really an improvement. So much of our tech has fallen into that. It's different and it's kind of techy and cool, but it's actually not better than what it claims to replace. And that to me is, is a problem. If you're gonna give me this whole new technology which requires way more stuff to buy, because think about it, you, know, like, you charge an iPhone, you get a cable and a charger. To use MagSafe, you've gotta get this pad with magnets and coils that is so much more waste when that pad wears out. I can get the super fast charger and it's built for this one phone and this proprietary battery technology. And when I go to another phone, if I go to another phone, this charge dock that I had really shouldn't be used with another phone. I don't think it's a good idea to put, you know, like a Xiaomi on a OnePlus fast, wire, fast wireless charger, right? So I have this OnePlus 10 Pro and I've got this 50 watt a super fast wireless charger. It's a warp wireless charger. I guess I need to keep buying one pluses or I need to get rid of this molded plastic package of cables and coils in a base station. That is so much more waste than just, oh, I kind of wore out my one plus USB-C cable. <laughs> So again, to me, it's like, even over time, not only is wireless wearing out my phone faster, but the accessories are significantly more e-waste when it's time to switch products or look at upgrades. I don't like that. A really high quality 60 watt to 100 watt rated USB-C cable will, should last a couple phone generations. I've got a Nomad cable, braided, nylon, really durable connectors. The boot is gorgeous. It's a three meter cable. So I'm not like you know, scrunched up at the edge of my bed if I need to charge my phone or my Steam Deck. I've got plenty of room to like route that cable, pull it up into bed with me. I'm not like, you know, just, you know, kind of tugged over to the side. That was an expensive cable. I wholly expect that cable to last years. <laughs> I can't say the same for a generation of a fast wireless charger. I, I, especially if you're into trying different phones, I, I don't think it's a good value proposition. Oh yeah, you guys were already talking about the, the OnePlus charger in the chat. I, I, I caught up, I got there. I'm slow, but I got there. <laughs> yeah, and see, Michael, this is what I mean, like, in what realm of average consumer would this ever play? The setup can be weird. Some require a QC wall wart, some a PD. A dumb wall wart gets you five watt default. Each one is different. Then you get the proprietary ones. It's tricky. It's tricky. Got to rock a rock a rock a rock a. It's tricky. Just got demonetized. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Fire Dragon. They're totally worth it. I'll, I'll, I'll be the Nomad chill. I really like their accessories. I've got a Nomad wallet. Um, no, uh, Jimmy writes, those Nomad cables are like 30 to 40 bucks. They are priced in a similar tier to Apple cables and are built so much better than Apple cables. So we can, we can definitely find USB-C cables for a lot cheaper. 
it is increasingly difficult, in my opinion, to find properly rated active power delivery 100 watt or 60 watt cables that are built as durably as that Nomad. And you get a couple of those Nomads, that is not cheap. That, that is definitely an expensive accessory purchase, but I would wholly expect, like I've had my Nomad for about a year, <clears throat> I would wholly expect that to significantly outlast the sort of less expensive, I don't want to say cheap, but the less expensive shielding and boots on most of the included cables that come with our phones. And you have more options for cable length. Get a longer cable, it will change your life. <laughs> like, oh, I need to plug in my cable and oh, I've got like this little charger by my end table. So I'll just sort of roll myself into a ball at the edge of my couch so the cable will reach as opposed to just like, oh, here, let me just use my phone. And I just pull the cable out a little further. It's so much better. It's so much nicer. <laughs> Gormlord, are you ever afraid you're going to accidentally strangle yourself in your sleep? No. <laughs> so I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. I, I game on my Steam Deck until I see my eyes are starting to blur. And then I unplug my Steam Deck and I turn it off and I set it down on my on my uh, side table by my bed and I go to sleep. I don't fall asleep with the devices like in active use. I don't use tech to the point of actively passing out. <laughs> I can see where people would be worried that I would maybe use my tech to the point of actively passing out. It's so bad. Um... Oh yeah, JMX Warrior. You do not want to mess around with proprietary charge standards. S standards. Um, JMX writes, I feel it's odd. My Oppo 64 watt plug won't charge my Xiaomi at 32 watts because the Xiaomi doesn't like it even with the Xiaomi cable. And how that brick is talking to the device. I mean, think about it. There's more compute power in a fast charging wall plug than what we sent astronauts to the moon. <laughs> There's more compute power in one of these wall plugs than the original Apple Macintosh. I mean, that's crazy. What these things do to communicate with the phone and to manage thermals and to balance fastest charging speed against the device being used, like if you're using your phone while you charge it, all of that stuff is being handled in real time with insane levels of electricity. Like, that is crazy power. We're talking like 100 watts that are being shoved into a chemical pouch that is enclosed in glass and metal that will stay in your pocket. And we expect that the vast majority of these things will not explode. <laughs> that is crazy. I mean, it's like when you really think about the... The internal combustion engine depends on a series of controlled detonations. And you're like, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't mess with that. I should probably let it run the way it's supposed to run. Um, don't play that game. The, the, the only chargers that I have sort of cross-purposed are the OnePlus uh, warp chargers. When OnePlus finally added... 45 watt power delivery the oneplus charger does a reasonably good job of talking to other phones that also support pd but it's still on the user like if you've got a phone that's got a really funky split battery cell using a high uh, proprietary 100 watt honor you can but i really seriously do not recommend swapping high output chargers with different phones. Um, I know Anchor, people have been talking about, Anchor just put out um, a, like a little press uh, event and announced a whole bunch of new products and stuff. I haven't, I haven't followed up on it just yet. Um, some of those Anchor chargers are really good, but if you want what the full capacity of the device as it's intended to be used, it's safest to stay first party because that little brick, the computer in that little brick 
is talking to the phone to say, oh, you've got a split battery cell. We know, we know each cell can charge at a maximum rate of 40 watts, and we're directing energy to each of those battery pouches in a specific kind of way to maximize the charge. Oh, the user is using the phone, and that's creating a thermal load. Let's scale that back to 20 watts per pouch, and they're still getting a really fast charging experience. You want them all speaking the same language probably being a little conservative there, but I do not think it's a good idea to mix and match chargers like that unless you're arriving at something that's sort of generally a universal language. You're not gonna get the fastest charge performance on power delivery, but most phones can speak power delivery. Might run your phone a little warmer because they're not actively talking about all of this little management stuff, but you're probably safer there, I would not mix, you know, a Super Vuk with a Xiaomi charger. I think that's a recipe for bad times. I am O. I drink some more water. <laughs> ah, yeah, MC. I mean, a, a lot of these phones, especially these like lower cost devices, I find the OnePlus N20 33 watt charger to be really fast and reliable. The phone never gets hot. 33 watts is a perfectly respectable plug it in, kind of top it off a bit, get on with your day sort of charge standard. Um, I'm telling you, like when, when I got the IQ 9 Pro, and I think that's a 120 watt charger and you could go from a low battery warning at 15% to 90% in, I want to say I did it in under 15 minutes. That is, hey, I just noticed my phone is about to die and I didn't plug it in at night. I've got to get dressed. You know, I got to take a shower, get dressed. You know, I'll chug a cup of coffee and then I got to hit the road. The phone is fully charged before I'm done taking my shower. <laughs> like it's... It's insane. I would not mess with that as a charge standard by using that charger cable with other devices. It is for the iQ9 Pro. That's what it gets used with. I have this ridiculous power strip right here. I've got one, two, three, four, five different chargers connected to it, and each one is used with a specific phone. <laughs> so bad. Um, from... Uh, from PAL tracks. I remember when the Lumia 920 came with wireless charging, I thought it was cool. And at the time I was, it was pretty new, but nobody cared. One of the things that definitely hurt those Lumias, like I held up my 1020 and my 830, was at the time we were also fighting that dumb battle between Qi and PMA. And so here in North America, AT&T went with PMA. And like everybody knew, anyone who was into tech, everybody knew PMA was probably going to lose. And it was so dumb having a proprietary North American charge standard because of licensing agreements. And eventually, Qi won out. But it was way too late for Nokia at that point. At that point, I like Microsoft had already bought them out. Um, yeah, I'm up in a 18 watts seems so slow now. You remember when we started getting like two amp chargers? How big a deal it was? Like, I've got a battery pack. The battery pack puts out two amp. <gasps> you can charge your phone in like two hours. That's so crazy. Man, the tech has definitely advanced on that. Yeah, we got a, a, a DT Anil with a super chat here. Thank you so much, buddy boy. Uh, this summer I purchased many games from Steam during their sale, but lack the hardware to play said games on my daily commute. What solution would you, a tech pundit, recommend for a gamer like me? That's a very good question, Aditya. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, it's this thing that I don't think many people have heard of yet, um, but it's this deck. It's like a mini PC, and you, if you, you, you bought games from Steam, um, and appropriately, it's called a Steam Deck. So I would definitely recommend checking one of those out. That's probably going to be one of those ways where you can play games mobile on the go, hook it up to your xCloud, stream some games. It's pretty good. <laughs> I'm only doing that because you did the Super Chat. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I'm I'm not sure Golan I, I'm 
I feel my experiences with the Honor have been pretty good. It's still an 8 Gen 1, um, and I think our expectations need to be kept in line whenever we're talking about 8 Gen 1 phones. But Golan writes, I have the Honor Magic 4 Pro, and I'm disappointed. Heating issues, uh, videos on 4K lag. Uh, the system was also lagging, and also you can only charge. You can only you can charge only with the Honor charger. Um, I have plugged in the Honor to my OnePlus charger, and like I said, on power delivery, it seems to charge pretty quick. You don't get the screaming fast 100 watt charging, and the phone is a little bit warmer on PD than it is on um, Honor tra Honor's charger. But it it charges. It it does the gig. Um, my experiences have been pretty positive. Uh, I can't say I've run into any significant performance issues until I'm really taxing it. So some of those videos that I did on docks, like I did a portable monitor, I did the next dock tablet dock, and I used it for some of my UPerfect, but it doesn't put out 4K. So the UPerfect I did more on the Moto, the next pad I did more on the Honor, and the Honor did well. Some of what you're describing could potentially be 8 Gen 1. It might not be an Honor thing. It might be Honor trying to get the maximum performance out of an 8 Gen 1. Um, but it won't be substantially different unless you go to a phone that heavily throttles the 8 Gen 1. The Honor is very much like a Moto. See, again... I feel because of some of the silly advanced use that I like to put phones through, I feel a bit more qualified to make this kind of a comparison. Phones like OnePlus and Samsung heavily influence the performance of the phone to maximize battery life and thermals. Out of the box, a Samsung is throttled pretty aggressively you do not get the full benefit of the fastest four nanometer chip in a galaxy until you dig through some battery settings, ditto a OnePlus. You can nudge them up, but even under a higher performance mode, if you really start using those phones, they aren't as fast as some competing devices. Where you, what you get is, like I said, better battery life and better consistency. A OnePlus still has kind of an obnoxious 60 frame per second cap on gaming. It is There are very few games that seem to be whitelisted to exceed 60 frames per second on a OnePlus 10. But there are a lot of games that perform better because the phone is limiting you to 60 frames per second. On a Xiaomi, there are a lot of games that will spike to like 90 FPS but then when you crash, you crash way lower than 60 frames per second. There was actually a reviewer who demonstrated on the Xiaomi 12 with the 8 Gen 1 that the chart on, on performance is like spike, crash, spike, crash, spike, crash. The phone never really seems to level out. The Honor and the Moto are more like that. A Moto Edge Plus will do exactly what you tell it to do. Not what you mean to do, what you tell it to do. I have turned the, the screen refresh up to a 144 hertz. I've put the phone into higher performance mode and the phone will give you every ounce of compute power that it can until the chip melts and the battery dies. That's not the best consumer experience though. You've got a phone that's running screaming hot and will start to lag and throttle and, and perform worse for it trying to do its best. So it's all a balancing act. The Honor is more like the Moto. There are so many of the tests that I run where that Honor is kicking the pants off of Galaxies and OnePluses and Vivos. It is a high performance hand, handset and it will do what you tell it to do but that might not be what you really meant it to do. So those have been my experiences. I can't really comment specifically because obviously we use our phones for very different things, I'm sure. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things like if you don't have a handle on what it is that this phone was sort of built to achieve, that's probably not the right fit for you. you know, again, I feel like so many techies are wearing the wrong size clothes because a Geekbench score and 
a YouTube reviewer with 10 million subscribers told them this was the bestest. And there's only a single chart of worstest to bestest. Instead of saying, well, here are some good options for people who need a stylist, and here are some good options for people who focus on gaming, and here are some good options for people who are really specific about photography. And as opposed to photography, there are different options that I would recommend for video. And then from there, if you're multimedia streaming, if you're doing office and document work, if you need desktop modes, if you need productivity features, if you need battery life enhancements, all of these are different. And if you're not choosing based on what you need, you're probably wearing the wrong size pair of pants. And that's a bummer. That makes me sad because I think a lot of people would be a lot more impressed and a lot happier with their tech if they were buying the right size pair of pants. I'm telling you, I've done this with my family and it works so well, but it's shut up and listen. It's listen to what they say they need listen to what they use their phone for, and listen to what they liked about their old phone, and they end up with a much better new phone, and almost always, they end up with a much better new phone that also has the benefit of being less expensive. It is such a fun game to play. It is such a liberating game to play. You get to point out to like my sister, she, she smashed her old uh, Pixel 4a, she's on a Pixel 5a, and her replacement phone was about the same price as replacing the back glass on an iPhone 13. Her whole phone cost about the same as just getting a repair glass panel on a more premium tiered device. That is so empowering. That is so comforting, especially in this current era of economic turmoil. That is such a better way to handle tech conversations with these so-called average consumers who should not be buying above $600. There is no excuse for it. If you're making those recommendations based on your YouTube metrics, you are actively hurting the conversation for devices that deserve more attention and more mindshare with consumers. And that makes me sad. Sorry, Golan, I didn't mean to kind of go off on that as a part of the conversation, but it, it, it makes me frustrated um, when we can't speak with that kind of specificity with tech enthusiasts. We don't have this kind of, I don't make my channel for average consumers, obviously. Um, I'm talking about like video rendering benchmarks. Mwah. But when I point that out to someone like, hey, you just shot that really cute video of your kid. Watch, you go into this app and you just trim the, the start and the end and you've got like the perfect little spot of your kid playing at the park. Blows their mind. Every time I'm with family who have Android phones, hey, let me nearby share you that photo that I just took Wow, that's just like AirDrop blows their mind. They are not getting any kind of actual real education. And whenever they go to seek out these larger YouTubers, those larger YouTubers aren't really telling them about the products they're interested in. They're telling them why they shouldn't buy the products they were interested in. And then that just gets compounded. I go to a carrier store. Hey, I heard about that new Pixel. Yeah, I mean the Pixel, I mean, but so-and-so with 10 million subscribers said it runs kind of warm. What you need to do instead is get the Samsung that runs even warmer and has worse performance and terrible battery life for the same price or more. Is that advice? That's terrible advice. So anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I kind of went off there a little. Sorry, Golan. <laughs> I know you were asking a different, or you were commenting on a very different specific point about your phone. I didn't mean to make that a whole separate tangent all on its own, but that's that's what the pajama podcasts are for. It's good times. <sighs> ah. Oh, Dave Burns is back just in time for me to start wrapping this up. Back from an incredibly long meeting. Oh, Muppinish, I wish. Um, also, can we expect a creepy gate mega photo showdown soon? I need to drive back by 
Um, I get really emotional talking about Creepy Gate, which is so silly. And I'm so privileged to be working in an industry where I can afford food on the table and a roof over my head. Our family, my family has been weathering the pandemic well. My old neighborhood where I would walk to go to the Creepy Gate, um, there are parts of that neighborhood that seem to be doing okay. And there are parts of that neighborhood that are not doing well. And those little tunnel freeway underpass walkable tunnels, um, basically on the 101, a whole stretch of like Encino, uh, there are these little tunnels. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Absentia, it's kind of like that. Um, not with creepy bug alien things, spoiler, um, but just dark long tunnels that get you under the 101 so that you can walk to the other side of the 101 uh, safely. Um, a lot of those tunnels are basically now rotating shanty towns um, where people who are not doing well and who need help and uh, we don't put the resources towards housing and feeding and sheltering and keeping people safe in our society. Well, it's shelter. Uh, it's, it, it protects you from the environment. It, it keeps you cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And right now there are a lot of desperate people out there that need help. And the last time, it was, it was probably six months ago, I want to say. The last time I drove by, I was expecting, like, I had a couple phones with me. Like, oh, hey, this is cute. I'm going to revisit the creepy tunnel. I'm taking a picture of someone's home to talk about low-light photo performance on a phone. On a phone that, you know is substantially more expensive. Uh, again, it, it's all the liberal guilt, right? I'm, I'm sitting there holding like $5,000 worth of phone. I don't really own these phones. A lot of them are just loaners. A lot of them have to go back to manufacturers. I get to keep, I get to hold on to some of them for really long periods of time, but they're technically not mine. I don't feel right selling them. I don't think that's a good look for someone in my position. It's not how I like to run my channel. And it just feels so tacky. There are people living right there. And I'm going to sit here and take a photo. Oh, isn't it a creepy tunnel? <laughs> Look at the photo and the, the lamp has flares on it. Oh, no. But please excuse all the people that are living in that tunnel. Uh, don't let them detract from my really sharp, witty criticisms of smartphone camera performance. So I, I should probably drive by again um, and just see. Maybe if it's clear, I might. But it just makes me sad. Um, it makes me sad because if it's clear, then that what, what that means is that the people in that community around, in, around Encino, they're not trying to help anyone, but they did make sure to send the cops to go kick all those people out. Um, which also just to me is, it's a tough psychological hook to see the tunnel totally empty when I also know that there were people who kind of needed protection were living there because they probably didn't choose to leave. They were probably ousted. And I understand why, but that also speaks to that neighborhood needs some kind of facility or some kind of community to help some of those people out. And it would be cheaper in the long run. <laughs> it would be just to put up some low cost housing to, to get those people some shelter. Um, I, yeah, that's what I would prefer my tax dollars going to uh, rather than like freeway expansion projects. But unfortunately, no, I don't have any plans in the short term to go and revisit the uh, the creepy tunnel. Um, I think we all, I mean, but when it was just a funny little thing in my in my smartphone videos, especially back during my pocket now days, we were also privileged to have experienced and enjoyed the creepy the creepy tunnel and the creepy gate. Now I've got the creepy pathway. If you're on the Patreon, I've got this one little like, like a uh, off-road pathway that I'm now shooting for my main light flare. Like I just shot on three different phones last night, um, looking at internal reflections on the 12S Ultra, the Vivo X80 Pro, and the Pixel 6a. Um, and there is definitely a clear winner in terms of lens coatings and optical performance. Um, but it's this you know, it looks kind of creepy. It's not as creepy as the tunnel, but it's like this little pathway that just, you know, sort of disappears into darkness and shadow. So instead, it's not as good. 
It's not as good as the creepy tunnel was, but it's it's close. <laughs> Oh, from McCorcoran, do you have any thoughts about the Nova launcher transaction? I'm in wait and see mode. I love Nova. I haven't been using it as often um, as we've been going through this Android 12 transition. I've really been trying to wrap my brain around what Android 12 is supposed to be. So I haven't been defaulting to Nova like I used to um, even just like two years ago. Uh, I am anxious about them getting sort of absorbed by... A sort of a telemetrics a data collecting organization. So I want to see what um, what happens with that kind of business arrangement or that kind of business relationship. I'm really hoping that someone like Michal uh, of of XDA fame. I, who who is Michal working with now? He's working with David Ruddick. Um, like I did their podcast talking about desktop modes. Michal is one of those voices in this space. Uh, maybe also snubs uh, in terms of cybersecurity. I would love to see someone a couple months from now install Nova Launcher on a, on a phone and then try to track any connections that Nova might be you know, sending information to. That to me would be the wait and see. Uh, if you're really security and data conscious and, and concerned about the, the applications that are siphoning your user behavior, then it might be worth looking at retiring Nova for a short period of time until we can get better data on what it might be doing. Um, it's enough of a concern for me that I am sort of quizzically looking at it, but I also lack the resources to properly uh, test what it may or may not be doing behind the scenes. Um, so from Muppinish, uh, sounds like an awful situation, maybe a TK Bay or SGG homeless interview and food. Um, I don't want to put people on camera. I don't, I think that's kind of gross too. I, I, I would instead, I, again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back here. Sorry. I, I, I get weird about stuff like that. And again, food. I come from such a food motivated family. When we feel bad, we eat. When we feel good, we eat. When we feel indifferent or apathetic, we eat. I mean, food is our life and entertainment as much as any other kind of media. Um, don't, don't wait for people to call attention to issues in your community. Um, right now, your, your neighbors are struggling. They might be struggling psychologically. They might be struggling medically. Uh, they might be struggling financially. Um, we don't need YouTubers and influencers to point this out. It's, it's smacking us in the face and we, we ourselves, if we're doing well, I'm doing pretty well financially and medically. I'm maybe not doing as well as I could be mentally or psychologically, but we, we already know this. We don't need to be influenced. We don't need to be educated. We know even in more affluent um, parts of our neighborhoods, people need help. Um, my wife and I, we contribute to a number of charitable organizations over the last two years. We've shifted some of our funds from like science and research and medical tech to food banks. Um, again, this isn't about me and it's not about me getting the right points for caring about people. It just We've got a little disposable income. It feels like the right thing to do. Um, and, and better than like raiding our pantry and once a year dropping off like expired soup, we give them cash. And I feel like that helps the food bank more than, you know, whenever we have like pantry donations to deliver, especially in an age of pandemic. Um, we, we really significantly shifted over into what money can we give? Okay then this is now going to go to food banks because we also knew like we live in a pretty nice little suburb of Los Angeles. And I know some of those families are making very difficult choices on do we feed our kids and not ourselves, but then also skip medications. Um, and there's no shame in 
visiting a food bank if you need the help. I am giving them money so that more people can use those food banks. And that's the sort of social safety net that we should expect, right? Like, I actually do have a bit of a buffer. <laughs> I, I don't know that I always will. Maybe someday in the, in the future, I might need to run by a food bank and just get white bread and peanut butter so that I can feed my daughter. I'm going to pay into this hoping I never have to use it. Um, and I feel like that's the only correct answer to help <laughs> when it comes to stuff like that. So I, I don't want to go down to the creepy tunnel and talk to people and put them on camera or make a big show out of, you know, this is what I'm doing to be a good person or something. I, I think we all have it in us and we all have that capacity. And if it's a mental health help, just checking in on an old friend or trying to play a co-op game when you know someone's struggling. If it's a medical help and there's a GoFundMe and you can chip in a buck, that's going to be a dollar that person didn't have before. Or if it's a community help, I know people need food. I can't imagine my life without food. I've never been hungry. Even when my family was struggling financially, man, we could always fire up some beans and rice. I cannot imagine being in a situation where I couldn't have beans and rice. And I know there are people tonight that won't be able to go buy beans and rice. And that kills me. So um, that's a downer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get so heavy. Um, uh, we should probably like legit actually <laughs> start wrapping this up um but there will be plenty more to talk about i've got a sponsored video coming up on a wacky little wearable port uh, portable fan i've got that e-bike uh sort of review coming up that's going to be a, a crowdfunded um electric bicycle that should be pretty fun i've got so much work to do wrapping up axon honor uh, starting uh, the pixel 6a for real the Xiaomi 12S Ultra is going to be front-loaded on the Patreon. We already have two sort of first looks at performance and camera tech. Um, then I really want to do just a brutal, and I'm debating whether or not this is going to be Patreon only, but it's going to be a brutal uh, Vivo versus Xiaomi photo showdown. Because, man, it is such an interesting fight looking at those different kinds of, uh, of tech. So... Uh, Dave Burns, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of throw this one out there, there too. Um, cash to food banks are some of the best of non-direct action most people can contribute to. Completely agree. Take, take a meal off of someone's mind and you will radically improve every, every person's quality of life. So if you can help, please, please do. Oh, Big John, that is so kind. Um, twenty dollars. Hey Juan, I'll add to that donation with you. I will. I will put. You know what? It's not much. I will put every dollar of these super chats into our next donation to our local food bank. Um, and when when we do when we do that drop off, I'll I'll get a receipt and I'll share it on Twitter. Um, thank you. That that is very kind. And and I I, I confront the 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 uh, the super chats here easily um, to help some other people out. Um, let me get this out of the way. Jimmy Fire Dragon, that is a great question that unfortunately I'm going to have to cover in, a, in next week's podcast or in another, in another video. Um, <laughs> Barry Johnson, Vivo versus Xiaomi to the death. Um, yeah. Oh man, it's going to be brutal. So folks, um, this, is, this is not going to be the, the normal streaming setup uh, coming back to the regular episodes of the, uh, of the podcast. I, I feel like I need that mental buffer from YouTube all the time. And Twitch has become such a great little pocket community for us to have these weekly conversations. Even if you don't feel like you want to sign up for Twitch and create an account and follow and subscribe, you can still jump in and catch the live streams or the replays. Uh, all of the replays are going to be Twitch also. Um, so every Monday morning, that's, that's where we're at. 
Uh, it's where I feel the community tools actually help empower this kind of conversation a little bit better. And then we don't have to deal with the YouTube algorithm, which is very bad for channels like mine when we put out podcasts on the same channel that we also make edited tech reviews. It's not good. <laughs> you have to make your whole own new channel and, and uh, kind of figure all that stuff out. So, um, just saw you guys are rocking my socks. Aditya Anil, again, never, never apologize for anything that you give. I'm, God, you guys are going to make me cry. Um, it's not much, but anything to help. And then Barry Johnson, did Juan say he will put these donations to a good use? I am in $20 super chat from Mr. Barry Johnson. I am... I'm going to feel real good about our next donation at the food bank. Um, so thank you. That really means a lot. I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go through my, uh, wrap up patter here, uh, because y'all are awesome. And, uh, I, I'm going to be overly sentimental because I haven't streamed on YouTube for a while. And I know my YouTube persona is, is snarky and aggressive and confrontational. Um, but the truth of this is, and why I seek out the tech community that I enjoy, I know for a fact, like all these names and voices and, and profile pictures that I see in this chat, you like to kind of hang out with some of these kinds of conversations, even when you don't completely agree with me, because it's, it's about being a good tech neighbor. It's about trying to help people. We like this stuff, we're entertained by it, and we carry knowledge, actual knowledge, not just regurgitating spec sheets, but some experiences that will really help those people around us. Um, and you probably don't get thanked enough for being a good tech neighbor. So it's always my privilege to say thank you for being a good tech neighbor. Thank you for your interest in these kinds of conversations and for your participation in illuminating difficult topics for those of the, those people in your circles of family and friends. And <laughs> you guys are killing me. Oliver with, with a super chat, here you go. And Jimmy Fire Dragon kicking in some, some pound sterling. Um, I'm gonna match it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wrapping this all up now, so d don't don't keep me on the stream any longer. But in addition to what we would normally give, I'm almost positive I can still hang with matching everything that you guys have donated here too. This is going to be a good one. I'm 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 really excited. So thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, folks. There's going to be a, a regular Monday morning tech chat show, news block and gadget block and links and stories and all that. Uh, next week, next Monday morning, uh, always kick off at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, so uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, be safe. I, I, I like to say it, take care of yourselves so that you can keep taking care of others. And I mean that in every way, physically, mentally, financially, medically. There's so much going on in the world right now, and we have to be looking out for each other. The, the, these kind of like little petty squabbles, Pixel 6a versus Galaxy A53, that's entertainment. It's not even infotainment. It's just theater, right? At the end of the day, someone needs a pocket computer as their main lifeline to communicate with other people. And we can be those that help others get the right fit for them as their, so their voice can, can contribute to conversations in the 21st century. Take care of yourselves so that you can take care of others. I'll catch you back here next week for another episode, for another stream. I promise I won't get all weepy because this was awesome. You guys are rocking my socks. I love y'all. I'll catch you back.